So hello everyone, my name is Sean. Um, I'm gonna be presenting today with Dimitri and Jan on the OpenRAC V3 for networking. Um, and before I start, I just wanna say a thank you to the community, um, my MetaMates. Um, I'm in the network construction group at uh, Meta. And we saw kind of a change uh, coming in the future and it seemed like some OCP products might be a solution we could deploy. So I came here in, in 2021 not knowing anything about OCP, any of the products, and it's been a great learning experience, being embraced by the community, my teammates, and I don't know if Steve Mills is out there anywhere, but he may remember me bugging him like incessantly on chat and email for information on OCP products and, and things like that. So thanks, Steve, for kind of introducing me to the, to the community as well. So the background for the new rack, um, we really have to talk about the existing uh, DC type one network um, for Meta. So that's basically your, your H buildings, largely front end production and some AI ML and some storage. Um, obviously we have a lot of AI today as well, but back then it was fairly limited. Um, and we, the way that network was constructed is the network rooms were dedicated, meaning your data hall was completely separate from your MDF and your BDF. And the network racks in those rooms were like four post, 19 inch AC power, so no in rack battery at all. And they were tied into a, a building level UPS. Um, and they were also stick built. So we would ship a pile of parts to the data center and completely stick build uh, the network racks from there. And then what started to happen is this rapid development of, of AI technology, we, we got a basically a new DC network design. And the large push for that new DC network design was obviously facility liquid cooling. But it also meant now we're deploying this rather you know, pervasive and extensive backend network. And that required a new network design as well. And one of the fundamental shifts there was that we pushed a lot of our networking switches that were previously in those dedicated rooms, we pushed those right into the data hall. And that's a space that network had never really played at scale before. And when we looked at it, um, again, these are all AC switches, no in-rack power. We looked at our network racks and said, okay, the network racks we have currently in these dedicated rooms are not gonna work in that data hall because um, the, 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 we needed to maintain that fungibility meaning that you know, these four post 19 inch racks don't really fit well in the, in the data hall. We needed to be able to mix and match these components as we saw fit. So a compute rack here, a network rack here. So we knew those racks were not gonna work. And that's when we kind of looked at, we looked at a few things, but we kept coming back to ORV3. What if we use that as a network rack basis? And then once we start to got, got that kind of in our heads about, okay, a compute, maybe an ORV3 rack, um, for network, we started to see some additional opportunities within the data center, at least for some of the new builds. So we started to look at some of our newer builds that still had core spaces, they just had a, a slightly different function and said, well, what if we used that rack there as well? It's got in rat backup. Now we can start to kind of homogenize the power within our data center. Um, we can start to scale down our building scale UPS, which also has, you know, for the, for the design, engineering, and construction people are listening, that also allows you to start to reduce your building footprint, which is also very good. Um, so again, a lot of, lot of synergies there. Another great synergy is once it's a compute rack, for the last 10 years, we've got a, you know, an ordering process, a delivery process, an installation process, and also offsite integration of compute racks that now we can start to take advantage because now instead of maintaining a, two processes, one for, you know, ordering and deploying network racks and compute racks, we can have like a unified process across the fleet, which is a great advantage. So you may, not be th you may be thinking, why do we, not, why do we just not use ORV3? Um, and that's certainly something we looked at. Um, you know, we could certainly take our network switches and put them in a tray. We've got a good you know, history of doing that with our top of rack switch. Um, some of the RTSW Mini Pack 2s we put in our Grand Teton. So that was certainly something we, we could look at, but that presents a couple unique challenges. One is around the bus bar, and one is around cabling, which I'll get to now. 
So firstly, with the, with the bus bar is, with ORV3, that bus bar just runs right down the gut, the back, the back of the rack. And if you look at any you know, traditional network switch, you got fans back there, you got power supplies back there. Um, on some of our switches, the entire main board pulls out the back. Um, so that's a, a pretty big serviceability. And, and in Grand Teton and other switches, we maybe had one or two switches in a rack, but now we're talking about a network rack that's gonna have eight to nine of these switches in there. So that serviceability impact on that bus bar really starts to become uh, something of concern in terms of mass deployment of these switches. And on compute, also the entire system is designed accounting for that bus bar. So sure, we could have gone back and said, well, let's redesign all of our network switches to account for that bus bar. Uh, let's maybe have a, you know, a rack full of trays, but at the end of the day, it's like less resources, less engineering to say, let's just design a rack based on ORV3 that can better accommodate network. And then the second challenge is cabling. So if you look at the, the, the first version of ORV3, I'm pretty sure it had the same canopy cutouts as ORV2. So this is at a time when compute had a smattering of cables coming from outside the rack inside. You maybe had eight LC duplex fibers, and you know, a handful of you know, Cat6, Cat5 cables for console and management. But network, we're talking up to over 2,000 fibers coming into this rack. So we knew this wasn't gonna scale. One, the canopy cutout was you know, too far over and too small, so one of the first things we did is like, that's gonna be, need to be addressed in order to accommodate network. Now I'll hand it over to Nian. Thanks, John. Um, so thanks to the community to listening to us for, to present ORV3N. Um, so ORV3N is meant to uh, address the issues that Sean has raised up, uh, which is real food serviceability. Uh, next is we are able to install network gears directly into the rack itself without requiring any adapter tray or shelves. Um, also, as Sean already mentioned, there's a lot of fibers coming into this rack, so we optimize the canopy cutout to support higher fiber count. And lastly, we install side panels to um, contain airflow containment. Uh, here are the key components of the ORV3N rack, starting from the left to the right. So we basically took the base wall mint, uh, bolted on four 21 inch to 19 inch adaptive brackets. Uh, on top of that, we added one OU pitch um, cable fingers for maintaining fibers and copper cables. Um, in the rear of it, we added a 48 volt DC offset bus bar um, to address some of the serviceability concerns that Sean has raised up. Uh, on top of that, we added side panels for airflow containment. Uh, for certain deployments, we introduced an accessory kit called the VCM, Vertical Cable Managers, to support higher fiber capacities. And lastly, we developed custom power cords for each network gears. Here's a look at the rack design overview at the bare metal. Um, we basically leveraged majority of the over ORV3N base frame um, with, so, with an exception of some modifications to the canopy. Uh, the rack dimensions are 600 millimeter wide by 2,283 millimeter tall and 1,068 deep. It weighs approximately 218 kilogram, uh, which is approximately 50 kilogram heavier than the ORV3. Um, we bolted 21 inch to 19 inch adapter brackets um, to be able to install network gears without needing additional shelf and trays. Um, we, in the rear, we added a 48 volt offset bus bar. Uh, lastly, um, side panels Containment comes directly with the uh, rack, whereas uh, in traditional ORV3, those only comes as an accessory and those, are, those get installed at the end of the rows for each ORV3. Here are some of the rack commons for ORV3N. Um, essentially, we have two zones. Um, the bottom six OU uh, open unit is for the power zone, and above that, there are 41 RU uh, rack unit um, for network gears. In the bottom six OU, four OU are dedicated for BBU, also known as battery backup unit or hold up energy. And above it, there are two OU dedicated for power shelves. Um, in the 41 RU, the bottom most two RU are for metal 
application, we use a Wedge 400 for rack management device. And the uppermost for RU is a fiber patch panel. Uh, this is where fibers comes into from the switches and uh, fibers from the job coming up and plug into the front. Um, the remaining 35 RU are free to use how you see fit to deploy your network gear. Um, one more thing, in the rear um, for the AC whip, we can support up to two AC, 30M AC whips that's routed to the right. Um, let's go into the details about the four post 19 inch EI adapter brackets. Uh, so these adapter brackets are 41 RU in height. Um, the outer dimension from front to rear is 788 millimeter. Um, the whole patterns in the front and the specs are EIA 310D compliant. Um, in the front to adapt the brackets, uh, we have 1OU pitch fiber um, clips that get uh, clamped on, and those are meant for fibers and copper cables um, management, and also we gain some additional space on the vertical cable track to support higher density. Uh, lastly, the front um, Adaptive brackets are also used our, for grounding path for our network gears. And we have tested it and found it to have very low impedance. Uh, next, I'll pass it to over to Dimitri. Thank you. OK. Um, <clears throat> so as Nyan mentioned earlier before, uh, we have an additional vertical cable manager. Uh, so this is for applications where you have high fiber counts that just don't fit into the traditional you know, uh, side of the ORV3 rack. Uh, so this is bolted on to the vertical structural members on the side of the rack. Uh, it's uh, the full rack height, so pretty much from top to bottom. Um, and it attaches to the base frame using two uh, M8 nuts, which just come in from the side and you can bolt in. Um, we can also attach this on the left side or the right hand side based on where this is located in the data center. Um, and then there is a door at the front which can also swing left and right uh, as you need to. Uh, this, also, this is shipped as an accessory kit, so we would never ship this installed onto the rack, but once the rack gets into the position at the data hall, you can put this VCM on, bolt the two screws, and you're good to go. Okay, now I'll talk a little bit about the bus bar architecture. Um, so as we mentioned earlier, we have a, you know, the main issue that we have with ORV3 is the, the bus bar running down the center, right? Uh, so what we did is we took the bus bar and ran it down the center for the bottom 6OU to input power from the PSUs as well as to accommodate the BBUs. And then we shifted over to the side. And so because of that, we have a 41RU at the side um, for networking gear connections. And then to connect the two, we have basically copper links, um, one for the positive, one for the return. Uh, and then in order to cover all that up and make it touch safe and uh, you all comply and all that. We have protective coverners, uh, which, also, which also acts as a stiffener uh, to make sure that nothing moves side to side. Uh, so this just attaches to the rack with simple screws. Um, and we also have a cutout on the stiffener uh, so you can fish in your AC whip uh, during installation. Okay, uh, a little bit more about the bus bar. So uh, traditionally we have ground rails on the ORV3 bus bar. Uh, on ORV3 end, there is no need for ground contact, so we kind of leveraged these rails as a lead-in feature for our connectors. Uh, so we changed the design a little bit to have better lead-in, uh, and we'll talk about the connectors on the next slide. Uh, there's also keying features. So when you install your connector, you can't flip it upside down. Um, you definitely don't want to flip your polarity and then turn the whole thing on, so uh, we want to make sure that never happens. Uh, and then the connectors are at a 1RU pitch uh, so that basically you can accommodate any system that's needed. Okay, so for the power connectors, uh, as we mentioned before, every system has a, has a cable that's running from the bus bar directly to your, uh, to your networking gear. And these can be plugged into dedicated slots on the RU vertical bus bar. Um, as I mentioned earlier, there's a 1RU pitch uh, for all of these and this is keyed. Uh, one of the great things that we did is on the connector, we added a pinch latch uh, so that you can just pop in the, uh, the connector into the bus bar and it stays secure. And then if you ever need to service it or remove it, you just press the, pin press the pinch latches and pull the whole thing out. 
Uh, a good thing is, is we on most of our systems, we have one cable per system, so it makes it very easy uh, to service. You don't have to have different SKUs of cables. Uh, and our goal is to standardize around the CRPS connector, um, which was developed through OCP. Um, so we're kind of slowly transitioning a lot of our networking gear uh, to have these DC power supplies with CRPS connectors so that we can kind of standardize uh, the whole cable and just change the length as needed based on different systems. Okay, uh, in terms of testing, of course, we went through the full suite of testing to make sure that this works. Um, so internally, we did package transportation testing, the typical vibration, corner drops, impact tests, 1,000 kilometer transportation tests, uh, and we passed everything there. Uh, we did rack stability testing. Uh, so you know, when you tip your rack over and you hit 10 degrees, you don't want it to tip over by itself. Uh, we had some challenges there because of the, you can imagine the offset bus bar, it moves your center of gravity over, over towards that area. So we had to make some modifications to the design to make it pass. Um, and then we also ran T-Rise testing on the bus bar. Uh, and uh, that testing saw that we can get about 36 kilowatts of bus bar capacity, which was more than we expected. Um, and it turned out to be a good result. And then also bonding and grounding is very important here. Um, like Don mentioned, we ground all of our networking gear to the EIA rails, and we wanted to make sure that that ground path is solid uh, throughout the entire rack. So uh, our compliance team helped us do a lot of grounding testing and that passed with flying colors. And then also our rack vendor helped us a lot with uh, doing some of the testing as well. So big thanks to them for that. Okay, Sean. All right, thank you, Dimitri. Thank you, Jan. Um, the thing I wish I had on video was the sounds that Dimitri would make whenever it would tip and go beyond 10 degrees. It was pretty hilarious. So in closing, call to action. Um, again, we will be releasing this spec to OCP very soon. Um, please go see the rack out in the meta booth. So that is a uh, eight switch uh, mini pack two. That's our FSW configuration for the data center. Uh, it's eight switches. Uh, it's got 2,048 fibers in it. So if you're wondering what where the fibers are going. Uh, those are LC connectors on the front. It's 200 gig FR4 going into the back of the fiber panel that we mentioned. And the back of that panel are MMC connectors. So that's a two by 12 row, very small form factor, multi push on cable. And the idea there is that we get the cable in there like that. And when the rack someday gets delivered from the ODM, all we have to do is install trunk cables once it rolls in. Couple other call outs, please look at the EIA rails on the front and the back. That does allow our site technicians to install these switches just like they do today. So the standard rail that works for our 19 inch racks works for the ORV3N as well. And then again, look at the power. Um, it's so clean on the back with that bus bar at the side and those short cables. When we did the road show on this rack, our site guys were singing our praises because they're used to managing dozens and dozens of AC cables that are never cut to length and they have to always store and manage that cable. And they're like, that'll take me exactly one minute to install the power for that cable versus two to three hours of striping and stuff like that with AC. So again, thank you all for your time. Very much appreciated. Time for thank questions or no? Thanks for the talk, um, Krishna from Google. Um, so earlier in the presentation, you guys had a comment where you mentioned the, in the core BBUs reduce the backup generator sort of uh, need. Could you sort of expand that on a little bit? Because my understanding is those BBUs are shorter term right through and your diesels are like usually for longer term. So how do they like, you know, uh, work with each other? Yeah, yeah it's, it just goes with the kind of reduced gen design where having more things on battery versus generator means we can maintain the batteries rather than have having to rely on the, the generators to kick over. So in our core rooms, we'd have to rely on that UPS generator combination to provide that, that cutover. But now if we start to replace those with batteries, we can start to reduce all that scope. Got it. So it's a combination of UPS plus gens yeah. together. Thank you. Thank you. Cool. Thank you, Thank you guys. Everyone.